Hello, my darling, and thank you for joining me for our newest story. I'm very excited to begin The Sorcerer's Apprentice because it is the first time we'll be dipping our toes into horror. The story is dark and a little bit twisted and will definitely be the perfect narrative to give you very vivid dreams if you happen to drift off. And do not worry, this will be read chapter by chapter in 16 parts, so you'll have plenty of opportunities to listen and fall asleep again and again. A special thank you to Jacob for selecting The Sorcerer's Apprentice as our newest adventure. Jacob, you will find that your name has been added in as a replacement for our protagonist, Frank Braun, to give you a few exquisite tingles along the way. For all of my darlings out there, you can show me your support by liking, commenting, and subscribing. And for a limited time, if you reach out to me with a favorite fairy tale or classic, like the one we're about to read, I'll work your name into future readings as well. Now, please, lay back, relax, and let all of your worries drift away. Relax your body. Relax your mind. And close your eyes. And let me take you into a fascinating new world. Our story is The Sorcerer's Apprentice also referred to as The Devil Hunters, written by Hans Heinz Ewers in 1910. Chapter 1 Thou who seekest grace or beauty here, be warned, for in these pages hovers terror asleep. And from these covers, grin, horror, infamy, and fear. A quote by Saint Anthony. Do come along with me, said Jacob. The old priest shook his head. It's impossible, he answered. Quite impossible. The small steamer on Lake Carta stopped. The two men followed the crowd ashore. Jacob looked for the porter of his hotel, found him at last, and beckoned to him and gave him his luggage receipt and handbags. Then he turned once more to the priest. May I accompany your reverence? No, if you'll forgive me said the old man. I have to go to the rectory to attend to several things there first. But if you'll permit me, I'll look you up at your hotel tonight. It will be a real pleasure, said Jacob. I'll see you at supper then, Don Vincenzo. The priest shook Jacob's hand. Yes, I will see you later then. Jacob walked slowly in the direction of the hotel which lay close by the lake. He ordered himself a room, washed himself, and wrote a few letters. He took a walk and returned just as the dinner gong was sounding. Instead of going to the dining hall, however, he first went to his room. He shaved carefully and slowly and then dressed for the evening when he entered the dining room, the third course was being served. He found the priest sitting at a little table near the window. I've made you wait, he excused himself. It's a bad habit of mine. 
Jacob looked over the wine list and asked for his guest's advice. Soon he hit upon a brand of which the latter was very fond. That's strange, he laughed. Just what I prefer myself. But he scarcely drank half a glass and ate very little. He did not order the courses that had passed and took care that the priest's plate did not become empty. For dessert, he peeled two large Calville apples. The priest ate these with cheese. Don't you eat apples either? The priest asked him. Certainly, answered Jacob. He took a slice and sprinkled a little salt upon it. The priest shook his head. Salt? You put salt on your apples? Certainly, your reverence. It's the only way to bring out the flavor of the fruit. At once, the priest dipped a slice of apple into the salt. Well, wait a second, that's too much, Don Vincenzo. Too much? Jacob laughed. The priest scraped some of the salt off. Is this better? Yes, that's better, replied Jacob. The old man tasted the morsel of apple. Ah, oh, yes. Yes, you're right. The pure flavor becomes more definite. I'll note that, doctor. I'll pass it on to our bishop in the near future. He knows how to value these fine little points. After all, one must get to the bottom of things. Oh, yes. To be sure, Don Vincenzo, said Jacob. That's the first thing to do indeed. Wait a moment, I beg your pardon. Why the first? Jacob filled his guest's glass again. Well, what I mean is, one's diagnosis must always come first and foremost. Suppose, for instance, we wanted to make an apple First, we must know exactly. Wait, said the priest. Make an apple. We don't want to make an apple. Jacob said, well, why don't we want to? We want to make everything. But let's take another instance. If the future art of making apples seems too remote for you, take some disease, cholera for instance. We can't begin combating the disease effectively except from the moment in which we know precisely which germs cause the disease and their behaviors. Exact knowledge is always first in all things. Don't you think so, reverence? Oh yes, certainly. The priest emptied his glass. I understand what you mean now, but if you'll forgive me, my mind isn't quite satisfied at your sudden substitution of cholera for our apple. You wanted to make the apple, didn't you, doctor? Just as we see it lying here or hanging on the tree, but cholera, your aim is just the contrary, to destroy it. You want to fight it. But surely not make it. Jacob smiled. Well, don't we? And why not, your reverence? You, to be sure, would hardly care to employ yourself that way. And I, well, I'll probably never have the opportunity either. But what about other people? Don't we, during any good year, invent? some excellent new means of sending as many people as possible, as swiftly and surely as possible, from life to death, torpedoes and machine guns, submarines and aeroplanes, lyodite and melanite and nitroglycerin and various other fine things. Why shouldn't one hurl 
some frightful pestilence into the enemy's country. Some yellow or black death that would be more effective than all the murderous guns in the world. The priest crossed himself nervously. Holy Mother of God, he said. May all the good saints guard against it. Jacob nodded. Yes, I hope so too. War is always stupid and has precious few aspects to which one can profitably turn one's interest. But you'll admit the possibility of creating pestilences, Don Vincenzo. Any bungler can do it, even today. To make apples, that's harder, to be sure. But we'll learn that too, sometime. We're still so young. Young, you say, asked the priest. Why, yes, your reverence. The earliest human being whose bones have been found lived scarcely three and a half million years ago. And you're calling that young? The priest looks straight and sharply into Jacob's eyes. Hadn't he once before seen? But surely he was mistaken. No, he had never seen this face before. But the expression reminded him, and he recognized it. Smiling, superior, captivating, despite any struggle on one's part. Once before, those features had frightened him. Somewhere in a picture, or was it? some drawing in an old book. He looked deep into his mind and stared at the man opposite him, the German, Jacob. The space was smoothly shaven, narrow and sun-kissed. The eyes were of no special color. They could have been blue or green or gray. Over the high forehead, lightly arching over delicate brows, fell confused strands of ash blonde hair. His top lip was pulled back above a half open mouth. His face appeared young, even very young, and yet again could have been older, but the priest could not venture a guess. The opal eyes looked at him laughingly, but harmless, almost good-natured. I think he's a good boy, the priest thought to himself. He's young, but he's genuine. Jacob answered the priest's long gaze with a smile. Then, however, his eyes turned away, wandered around, and looked through the open window upon the lake. And the priest understood those eyes at once, dreamy, fantastic, lost-seeking eyes from the land of the soul, where all of our yearnings dwell. Then the other turned his head again, and looked very seriously at the priest, his gaze confident and almost threatening, thought the priest. And though he did not meet Jacob's eyes directly, he felt the glance keenly. And yet it seemed to him as if this strange and baneful power had not come from his eyes at all, or not wholly at least. Jacob saw his gaze. No, no, your reverence, you don't know me. He interrupted the priest's thoughts. This morning when you came aboard at Sermione, 
You saw me for the very first time. Jacob laughed at his own joke. It was an unspoiled, healthy, youthful laugh. What does this mean? asked the priest, a trifle confused and yet calmed at the same time by Jacob's good-natured laugh. Can you read thoughts? Is it so hard? You have a telltale face. But do drink some more now, Jacob said. He filled the priest's glass again. Do you smoke? He handed the priest his cigar case. You know, Jacob said, nearly all people have faces such as yours, and especially in the clergy, and it's difficult to change, but you look to me like an open book. Well, said the priest, thank God all men can't read that book. You're quite right, Don Vincenzo, said Jacob. The number of illiterates is frightful. But there we are again. Reading is the first thing. Knowledge. It is the act of sight, of perception. And only then comes the other, the writing. And in that is the creative act. No, that's not for us, dear doctor. Not for us priests, at least. Ah, yet, said Jacob. I know one who could do it well. A priest? Yes, a priest like yourself. More than that, your namesake. I am sure you know him. The priest thought for a moment. Vincenzo. Vincenzo Alfieri? Surely you don't mean Father Vincenzo Alfieri of Padua. That's the very one I mean, said Jacob. And you know him? Yes, I believe I know him quite well, Jacob replied. The priest was shocked. He is such a gifted man. He was the best preacher in Italy. He can read and write, a very creative soul. I once heard him speak in Padua. That was eight, no, maybe nine years ago. I don't remember what he said, but I'll never in my life forget how he spoke. It seemed to me as if he were carrying my soul to far, far heights. Where is he now? They say the Pope has... Oh, they say, yes, they say, Jacob interrupted him. I can assure you, by the way, Don Vincenzo, that His Holiness really has no reason for breaking off Alfieri's activities. It was merely a silly intrigue on the part of the Roman Jesuits, and finally a question of showing their power against Cardinal Mary Duval, whose protege he was. I'm convinced that the Pope saw through their clumsy scheme. But he wanted to put an end to the contention. So he compromised and sent the Paduan to Spain. And does he preach in Spain then? Yes, replied Jacob, in Madrid, and with the same overwhelming success. And I tell you that the moment which he creates is no danger at all to the church. He helps the church, rather. Imprison him in a cloister for six years, and there may arise in him a Mahomet or Luther. He reads, but he understands only a little of what he reads. And so he writes dusty books thumbed over many times. The priest looked at Jacob without understanding. Alfieri writes. Why, what does he write? Jacob laughed, almost to himself. Why, he writes nothing, of course. But he creates. 
Only what he creates is dusty and stale. It's poor stuff and harmless. But in all events, he works creatively. And for that reason, I love him. The priest nodded at this. Very well, doctor. But what in the world does he create? Jacob leaned forward across the table. He rested his elbows on it and stretched his hands slightly forward. Don Vincenzo again felt the gentle compulsion of those strange eyes, but his own imprisoned glance rested on Jacob's hands. They were large, strong hands, hands like the horrible paws of a beast of prey. His fingers spread apart were narrow, but bony and thick at the joints, inexorable hands which could wind themselves around the throat like ropes, strong, wild, pitiless, fearful hands. The impression came from them even more than from Jacob's eyes. The priest stared at those hands, as if from afar the slow and almost solemn words floated to him as Jacob spoke. The Paduan creates. He is a creator. He tears a thousand souls from out of a thousand bodies and molds them into a single soul with the flames of his speech. There they stand, children, women, and men, each separate, ridiculous and pathetic creatures. And the Paduan grasps them and kneads them into a great whole, into a single strong mass in the guise of a mad and mighty beast. This is what he creates. That's it, Don Vincenzo. And then Jacob sighed and slowly leaned back. He lit a cigarette and exhaled the smoke into the light, puffing rings. Only, Jacob continued, and it's a pity, a great pity, that he cannot read very well, this Paduan. And so he shatters the hundred thousand small thoughts in all these heads and does not give them one great thought in place of them. All have the same experiences as those you relate, Don Vincenzo. They will remember all their lives how he spoke, yet they have all forgotten what he said. That beast is there, that splendid mighty creature, but it can neither run nor bite. Oh, it's a pity, a great pity. He might have become an antichrist. Instead, he will remain a harmless preacher all of his life. How happy I would have been to teach him to read. Now come on, Don Vincenzo, do drink something. You look parched. The priest was silent. He stared at Jacob. But slowly, he grasped his glass, lifted it, but then put it down again on the table. Softly, he asked, Doctor, are you a Catholic? This question came swiftly, suddenly. Jacob, however, did not hesitate to answer. Not at this moment, he said. Who knows what I may be someday. He drummed gently on the tabletop with his fingers. But let us not discuss that, Don Vincenzo. We won't contend about religions. This morning, on this streamer, I addressed you, an utter stranger and you gave me some information in a very amicable manner. 
it would be very ungrateful of me to involve you now in the kind of dispute that always becomes vexatious. Oh, no, 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 the priest laughed. I'm surely not afraid. I stand on firm, solid ground. Oh, do you think so, asked Jacob. The German's voice was taunting, and yet somehow compassionate. You stand just where Alfieri stands. This ground looks hard as the stone of your mountains, and yet it is as impalpable a mixture of loose, nebular spots. Ah, firm ground. Just give this man an immovable point on which he may stand, and he will lift all Rome straight out of its hinges. It is always the same to have the great cognition that is the secret. The priest was frowning. I don't understand you, doctor. I believe you, Jacob answered. But hadn't we better drop this subject? I asked you to point me to a quiet, lonely place in your parish where I might stay undisturbed for a few months. You mentioned Val de Scodra. Yes, I did, the priest answered, a little concerned. Well, tell me, said Jacob, is it quiet there? Yes. Is it lonely there? Oh, yes, it's lonely. You will find no more remote village in the entire world. Jacob stretched out his hand across the table. Don't be angry with me, your reverence. We are all miserable sinners. Jacob's expression was so harmless, so good-natured, that the priest couldn't help but laugh. He took the hand before him and shook it strongly. Oh, I'm not angry at you, doctor, but I did give you all possible information this morning. Jacob nodded, and I know it all quite exactly as well. Unfortunately, I do have an excellent memory, and so I'll soon be living with the good innkeeper, Peppino Raimondi, and, well, hey now, why don't you come along, Don Vincenzo? You were telling me that you were on a trip of inspection through your parish. Aren't you going to visit this village? It becomes your congregation in the narrow sense and is your native village, am I right? The priest interrupted him. Why, after all, would you want me to come along? Why, asked Jacob. It's a whim. I beg your pardon. I'm planning a piece of work. I must tell you that I am a writer, and for this purpose, I need a quiet hole in the mountain. I want to work there, or, who knows, maybe I won't. In all events, I want to be quite alone for a few months, quite alone with myself. Now the plunge into that condition is just like the plunge into an icy bath. You stand there, you hesitate, you wait another minute or two, and then you take that plunge. You see, Don Vincenzo, if you travel with me, I'll have your company for a day or two before I take my cold plunge. Your health, doctor. The priest laughed merrily and drained his glass. You want me to act as a comfortable bathrobe for you? Unfortunately, it can't be done. Really not said the priest. It's quite impossible. Jacob looked at him askance. Impossible? A priest who can't visit a village in his parish? Cannot, I mean, said the priest. Let us say rather, will not. 
I found a letter awaiting me at home this evening, and it seems to make it appear desirable that you do not go to Val de Scodra either. Really, your reverence, said Jacob, this makes me curious. Am I not to go, really? Do you think I would become dangerous to the village, or that perhaps the village would somehow endanger me? No, no, said the priest, of course not. But according to my news, the Haldiscodra doesn't seem to be anywhere near quiet or calm. Something is going on there. Oh, well then, said Jacob, you are pouring water into my ice-cold bath. Well, what is happening there that could be of any interest to me then? Probably nothing, said the priest. In all likelihood, nothing at all. The people are holding fanatical meetings. Jacob looked at him for a moment. Who are? The people of Val de Scodra, replied the priest. The real originator is named Pietro Nascler, or Mr. Peter, as he likes to be called. The villagers call him the American. Jacob became attentive at this. And who is this Mr. Peter? Let me tell you the things as they happen, doctor priest replied, and then you will grasp the connection at once. You must know that a great many people in our poor mountain villages emigrate to America annually. In the entire Trentino, there is no other section from which so many go. Most of them remain over there but a few cannot forget the old homeland after all. They return as soon as they have earned money enough to buy a piece of land here. Peter Nosclair is such a one. Thirty years ago, when he was 16, he emigrated. First, he lived in New York, then in Chicago, and finally somewhere in Pennsylvania. He didn't have much luck anywhere, though, and scarcely earned enough to supply the daily bread for himself and his wife, a Bergamese woman whom he'd met in America. It is fortunate that they had no children, and now it seems that there, in Pennsylvania, he was brought into contact with a fanatical sect which he joined at first, probably, from purely material motives. These people obviously took a kindly interest in him, so that the care for his daily bread was immediately removed. He had once been a cobbler, and then he turned into a regular shoemaker, and then he was the owner of his own shoe shop. Then his great stroke of luck came, on the occasion of a lottery which the congregation arranged in order to raise funds for a new church, Pietro drew the first prize of $20,000. He stayed there another year, but with the deeply rooted prudence of our mountaineers, he could not make up his mind to invest his wealth in any business. In addition, Nostalgia for his own home troubled him more than ever. So he came back. He didn't stop anywhere, returning by the same route, by way of Amsterdam, Munich, and Vienna, over which he had gone so many years before. Even here, he only remained one night in the city and then traveled to his ancestral village. There, he soon found a farm that he could buy, and he has been living on it now for three years. Jacob laughed at this story, 
Okay, well, and your Mr. Pierre Cho now passes his time at home spreading the strange doctrine, which is so lucky for him, I ask. Yes, that's about it, the priest affirmed. It's no particular doctrine, by the way. I've tried, quite in vain, to discover what the man is really driving at. You see, he lives there on his farm and hasn't a thing in the world to do. At my advice, he invested his money in government bonds and a bit of farming, of which he knows nothing, as well as the household, is taken care of by his wife, and they also have the help of a manservant and a maidservant. At first he busied himself with his little garden. He also opened a little shoe shop. But both together don't take up an hour of his day. So the memories of his brethren in Pennsylvania came over him. How did he start? asked Jacob. The priest replied, He held devotional meetings in his own house. And then he gradually attracted others day laborers who worked for him, or people he had loaned money to. You understand, he was a leader of sorts, of his village, and is respected. Everyone is anxious to please him. Well, tell me then, said Jacob, what does he preach? The priest replied, repentance. He leads the people in congregational prayer and singing. They're all bored to death in their forlorn village the minute they stop working. So the Americans' meetings form a very welcome change. More and more people flocked to them. Soon his own room grew too small. And now he has built a big barn as a proper meeting house did he and his sect succeed from the church in due form? asked Jacob. Secede, God forbid, replied the priest. It seems that among his brethren in America, too, none gave up his church connection, whether he was a Protestant, a Catholic, a Quaker, or a Methodist. I have talked it over with Pietro several times. He isn't really clear in his own mind as to the aims of the congregation in Pennsylvania. He uses the same phrase as constantly, speaking of repentance, of sanctification, even here on earth, of fighting the devil, and similar things. And for these purposes, the Catholic Church alone does not seem to suffice for him. Does he openly oppose any of the rites and sacraments of the church? asked Jacob. Yes and no, replied the priest. He says, for instance, confession is an excellent thing, but it isn't enough that one whisper one sins into the safe ear of the priest. One must find the courage to confess them in public assembly. That is the only way one may succeed in banishing the evil spirit. The devil, he says, creeps around everywhere on earth, and one must drive him away with song and prayer. Why, interrupted Jacob, that's quite in the manner of the Salvation Army, Don Vincenzo, and it doesn't seem to me to be acting quite in the spirit of the church. And for you to be entirely inactive and simply look upon until the movement becomes unmanageable. Now, said the priest, you don't know our mountains, dear doctor. If you did, you would pass a different judgment on me to pay no attention to it, to let the people have their own way that is the only thing we can do in this case. 
these people you see grow up deep in their valleys, surrounded on all sides by mountains that grow into the clouds. The steep walls oppress them. They live there as if in a narrow prison. Their world is infinitely small. They never see the horizon, and their glance never goes beyond that deep and narrow hole. And so they grow up, generation after generation. Their poverty is stricken. Life is narrow, small, and surrounded by walls of rock. Go there, and you will see how right I am. And each has some infirmity. One is crippled in body, another is crippled in soul. They grope around like blind men and have so forgotten the nature of life that they do not recognize it, even out in the great wide world. Pietro was in America for 30 years and knows no more of it than this bottle sitting on this table. It is as if the mountains have pressed upon the spirit of this folk, weighed it down, and held it in an iron vice for centuries. He interrupted himself with a smile. And now you are about to ask, and you yourself, Don Vincenzo, are you from there too? I wouldn't have asked that, said Jacob. Oh no, replied the priest. But you thought it all the same. Confess now. I thought it perhaps, Jacob replied. I knew it, the priest continued. Yes, I am from Val de Scodra myself, and therefore I know the people there better than anyone else. But I was taken away when I was a small boy, down to the great plain, and even here, by the lake, you see, there is a different race. The people here sail back and forth across the blue waters of Garda, and no one clings to any one spot. And I live down there, where there are no mountains at all. And then I live by the sea, where one's eyes wander far into a distance without end. And there I learned to understand that not only on a great and level land, only near mighty rivers or the infinite sea can a great, free, and strong people live. The priest took a deep breath and emptied his glass once more. But these Tyrolese folk of mine, he continued, are small and weak and wretched, whether their language is German or Italian. We proclaim the good Andreas Hoffer and the brave Father Hospinger as our heroes, and we imagine that they fought for liberty, and if you tell anyone that they fought against freedom and for the blackest reasons, he will laugh at you and scorn you. Jacob looked at him for a moment. And you're telling me this, your reverence, as a priest? Yes, the priest replied, with some acidity. I am a priest, true. But above all, I am an Italian, even if I am a subject of the House of Habsburg and the nation whose language I speak the people of the plain and of the sea won liberty, and they won unity, only with the help of France, and always in a struggle against Rome and Austria. The heroes of the Tyrol have always fought for these powers. That was their liberty. Even today, after a lapse of a hundred years, they tell of the good Emperor Francis, and yet that was the same ruler who once said, People, what are people? I know nothing of people. I recognize only 
subjects. Jacob laughed lightly at this. And yet the very Emperor Francis, if you'll pardon me, your reverence, was not a German at all. He belonged to the people that you love. He was 99% Italian. Oh, you may be right, said the priest, and I confess I know nothing of that. But for the folk of the mountains, he was simply the emperor, and his red breeches were an object of reverence to the Tyrolese, and still are to this day. And how many people think as you do, Don Vincenzo, asked Jacob. Only a few, I am certain, replied the priest. The mountain districts are clerical, Roman and Austrian. Hoffer and Speckbacher are heroes of liberty, even among those of us who speak Italian. He sighed heavily before continuing. Think, they don't think at all, these cavemen of the mountains. They do not even dress. They scarcely live. They vegetate like decaying fir trees. Their skulls are small and flattened. Deformed goiters hang from their necks. They love God and the Savior and the Virgin. And they are the most pious Christians in the whole world. But even we priests are sometimes struck with a kind of horror when we see just how much they adore the saints. As the bishop once said, our mountains have more gods than Greece and Rome and all of Asia. And then sometimes their glance turns inward. They become fanatic and they fall into ecstasy and attain second sight. In Sempiglio, on the other side of the lake, behind Monte Baldo, there lives a mountain peasant who foretells every fire that takes place within a radius of many miles, and often hours in advance. And he is not the only one by far. Scarcely a year passes but that in some remote village these religious visionaries arise. So you see what is happening in Val de Scodra right now is nothing new. The only new element is that Mr. Peter throws in a few American catchwords and gestures. Jacob looked at him, and you let these people quietly go on their way to you, your reverence. Yes, the priest replied, that's it. These are the tactics that our bishop has followed for over 12 years. He is a very wise man. It is the best way, I assure you. Some of our priests shook their heads at first. Today they have all come to see that he is right. Did you ever hear of the ecstatic enthusiast of Mezzovenito. No, your reverence, Jacob said. I don't think so. The priest went on. It was a quarter of a century ago. The people of that utterly remote valley preached repentance. Some small prophet led them. They arranged long processions. They sang and prayed and cried and ran throughout the neighborhood and the villages nearby. Their militant pastor tried all means of bringing them to reason, first by kindness, then by severity, and the bishop of those days turned to the authorities. The movement was suppressed, but not without actual fighting. And what was the consequence? several dead and many wounded on both sides. Three people were put into insane asylums, no less than 56 into penitentiaries and jails. 
when he fled, a considerable number emigrated away, and to this day half of the village is empty. And then there was a great scandal and an outcry in all of the newspapers. No, no, our bishop is quite right. We must do everything to prevent a recurrence of such events. And you do everything by doing nothing, asked Jacob. Yes, doctor, the priest replied. Nothing, absolutely nothing. And in this way we achieve the best possible results. We let the people do quite as they please and withdraw quietly. After a short while, this peculiar intoxication passes away and all stream back to their chapels as if nothing had happened. It was but a flickering fire of straw which delighted these enthusiasts like children and which was extinguished as swiftly as it flared up. For you see, there is never a definite idea involved. No one knows what he really desires. It is a harmless illness of the mountains, nothing more. Our bishop calls it valley fever. Jacob looked at him for a moment and then asked, And does he know of this new epidemic in Val de Scodra? Certainly, replied the priest. I made a report of it at Triste not long ago, when the affair seemed to me to be lasting rather long and it was assuming much larger dimensions than before. The bishop laughed and averred that at least these new Pennsylvania methods offered a change in the monotony, and he spoke some excellent words which I impressed upon my memory and which I will repeat to you now. Long after the roaring and rushing mountain brook of these shallow enthusiasts has spent its foaming madness, one will behold it in its majesty, the deep and quiet river of the church. That stream of God beside whose waves the holy city is glad, that place of the dwellings of the Most High. Thus, said the priest, my bishop spoke to me and urgently advised me to be sure to remain calm. For every pressure, he said, only causes a stronger counter-pressure to arise. It has been months now since I was there. The last time I celebrated Mass in their church was for one person, or, if you prefer, one and a half for Mr. Peter now holds meetings on Sunday mornings, and of course, they all prefer him. My congregation consisted of Teresa, the daughter of the landlord. I recommended the girl to you as her confessor. The landlord himself was there, but he only counts as half, for he is really an unbeliever who never usually attends Mass. He only came along that time, out of courtesy, so to speak. A little too, perhaps, from a spirit of opposition to the American. It wasn't much of a sacrifice on his part, for he is very hard of hearing, and assuredly didn't understand a word of what I was saying. By the way, his coming had a rather unpleasant consequence for him. He was mayor, but at the recent elections they chose the American. That's what Teresa has just written me. She's my little spy right now in Val de Scodra. The priest took a letter from his pocket and looked into it. The same thing he said over and over again and the end is not in sight. Four times a week they have great meetings of repentance, with singing and with tumult of all kinds, 
with wild instruments. That's another one of those American inventions that my dear nephew has introduced. Wait a moment, said Jacob. He is your nephew, Don Vincenzo? Ah, uh, yes, said the priest. Didn't I tell you that before? Pietro is the child of my only sister. And that's the reason why I want to spare him all difficulties with either the secular or ecclesiastical authorities, which, in the final analysis, would only make things much worse. But you understand now, doctor, why I can't accompany you. I dare not go there again and preach to empty benches. That would be hazarding the dignity of our holy church to put cotton in one's ears neither to hear nor to see to leave the people quite to their own devices that is the right way only I doubt whether they will leave you in peace either with those wild concerts of drums and rattles and fifes to be sure Raimondi's house lies at one end of the village, near a little lake, and the American's farm. With its meeting barn is a little way up the mountain, far at the other end. Jacob laughed a bit at this. Well, then the disturbing noises in Val de Scodra won't be so troublesome to me. Are you really going to try it, doctor? asked the priest. Assuredly, said Jacob, and no later than tomorrow. Perhaps the American is a man whom I can use. What do you mean? asked the priest. Whom you can use? Yes, your reverence, replied Jacob. I will collect extraordinary people. It is a whim of mine, you might say. But, asked the priest, but what would you do with him then? How can one ever know, replied Jacob. The moment decides. There was Columbus, who ran around with a fine notion in his head that was stolen from a good friend of his. Isabel, the Catholic, gave him three old boats and a hundred jailbirds. He fared forth and found a new world. Who knows what Pietro might find? The priest shrugged his shoulders with a bit of impatience. He asked the priest. I tell you, he has no directing thought at all. But, replied Jacob, but suppose you were to give him one. A thought, but what thought, asked the priest. I don't know, said Jacob, anything. The thought he needs, maybe. There lies a certain power in the deep valleys of these mountains, a mysterious, ecstatic, mystical power. And year after year, it is wasted in the smoke of a wretched blaze of straw. One should not let such power lie barren. This time the priest frowned Jacob. No, this is a disease, this power. The quicker it goes up in smoke, the better for us all. Jacob leaned far back in his chair, and his eyes assumed a strange glow. No, my friend, Jacob said softly. That isn't true. Nothing should go to ruin until it has a chance to live. Oh, you mean evil then, said the priest. No, not even evil, said Jacob. It has a right to live like everything else. Only that which is ugly is insignificant. Jacob's voice gathered energy. His hand grasped the napkin like a claw. Let it but grow, that which you call evil. 
it will wax great in everything that is great. It is beautiful. The basis of thought interrupted the priest on which I stand. This time Jacob interrupted the priest. I know, Don Vincenzo, on what basis you stand. But is it necessary for all men to stand upon your same basis? Why not let your nephew find his happiness where he hopes to find it? Why should one wish this flame to be extinguished because it can find no further fuel? Why shouldn't one throw more fuel upon it, beams and tinder, so that the flame may flare up out of the valley and rise like a red torch far out of these mountains and into the clouds. The priest shook his head. That's all very well, doctor, only my poor nephew will never understand your meaning. Jacob looked to him. His voice was serious as he replied. He doesn't even need to understand. If only he becomes capable of that creative act. If only he can weld his mountaineers into a single mass, as the Pajuan preacher did. I want that beast, that mighty beast, Don Vincenzo. Trust me, I will teach that beast to bite. The priest crossed himself at this. May God himself forbid it. Gently, Jacob leaned across the table. Ah, oh, do you think so, your reverence? Well, in that case, one must just knock at another gate. The priest jumped up, and his voice was shaky when he replied. What is it you say? The priest received no answer. His lips trembled a little, as did his hands. He conquered his excitement with difficulty. With eyes wide open, he stared across the table at Jacob. Will you answer me one question, doctor? Assuredly, replied Jacob. Well then, said the priest, who are you? And then Jacob stood up. A bright and childlike mirth lit up his face. Who am I? He answered. I'm no one very special at all. My name is Jacob Braun. And I can read.